Right, I am absolutely delighted to be joined by Shemrock, an up-and-coming fighter from Liverpool. He's got this absolutely amazing story from a life of crime to going on the run, ended up in Malaysia, in prison for a crime he didn't commit. And now he's out. He's doing amazing things within the community with an organisation called Cell. So we're going to get into all of that. But firstly, let's go right back to the beginning. How did you end up going down the wrong pathway? Um, oh, that's a big question, Alan. <laughs> um, don't know. It's just one of them. Like, they're just school weren't really my thing. Um, everyone around me, we were all out on the streets all the time. Before you know it, you're with the older ones. The older ones are all selling drugs, and then before you know it, I end up following the same path, lad. And then, yeah, I think not not having. Not having maybe no positive role model, not having no hobbies, not going to school. It's just a it's just a, a bad cycle, lad, isn't it? And you're only gonna end up in a bad place. Absolutely. I suppose that's the positive thing that so many kids get from doing martial arts when they were younger. And I imagine that maybe you wish you would have had that while you were growing up. See, I always do think I wish I would have found martial arts when I was younger, but at the same time, the version of me that I was back then. I could have tried it once and said, nah, I don't like this. Because maybe I couldn't have, I couldn't have had the discipline or I couldn't have had the face to come in and get beat up every day. Maybe it took me going down the path I had to go down and going there maybe a bit older and a bit more mature to realise how much I like it and stick to it. So even though I found it at a later stage, I'm still glad I found it, lad, because where would it be without it? Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. It seemed like you were a person who was basically put into the wrong circumstances, despite the fact that you always had good morals on your shoulders, because I know that even when you were going down what could be described as a wrong path, you were still keen to go to college, do all that sort of stuff. And I know there was an occasion, again, when the police came in and you accused you of doing something that you hadn't done with the stolen goods. And I can imagine that must have been a pretty frustrating moment for you. It's weird, lad, like when I tell people that I've got a dislike for the police. They don't understand it really, lad. But they don't they don't know what we've been through. We haven't had to live life in our shoes. Like my 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 mum's been disabled by the police. My, my like the police will come in and beat my mum up. I seen from a young age, police kicking the door off. Police used to harass me on a, a fucking a daily basis. I can remember being twelve years of age and seeing police and thinking, I've got no I've got nothing on me. I've done nothing wrong, but if these try and stop me, I'm gonna run. Like, that shouldn't be the mindset of a 12-year-old lad. It should be, these are here to protect and save me. But that's not that's not the point of view I had of the police at a young age. And I feel like, even now, I still don't have a good, a, a good outlook of the police, but it's half what they put me through. But I also think that at some point you got to, get past that shit and fucking move on with your life, lad, and that's where I'm at now. So when you make this decision to go on the run, obviously you were accused, again, of a crime you didn't commit, the, the violent burglary that you weren't involved in. There must have been yeah. this feeling of, if I go back to this police station, they're going to put me down for something I've not done, and I've got no trust in them that they're going to do the right thing by me. No, 100%. I thought if I get nicked or if I go and on myself in, I'm just going to jail. There was no, like... I, I, I didn't really understand the whole process of what would happen because I've never been to jail before. But there was no doubt in my mind that I was guilty until proven guilty. Do you know what I mean? And even though I knew i never done it, I, I just thought in my head, fuck the police, I'm going to run. And if they catch me, they catch me, I'm going to make their job 10 times harder. And it wasn't till I did run ended up in Malaysia that then I found martial arts and that kind of changed my life to a different path. So could you talk me through that period where obviously you go to France, you get the train there, you get out to Malaysia. That must have been a mad journey in itself. And what it was like in that period before you went into the gym for the first time, was it a worrying time for you? Was it? Did it feel like you were living like a movie? Um, I can't say it felt like a movie because it's just my life, isn't it? Like I didn't know no difference. I'm just I'm just living my life. Um, it was weird, lad. Like going, I, I, 
in my mind at that point in my life, Liverpool was the best place in the world. And don't get me wrong, I'm proud to be a scouser and I love Liverpool and I'll always love Liverpool. But when they say travel broadens the mind, it really is true. And I feel like getting to leave the country as a as a young adult for like the first time on my own two feet, I feel like that really like made me grow up as a person. I got to meet loads of new people, experience a different side of life. And not only that, I got to see like people viewed me differently. Like when I'm in Liverpool, I just thought everyone just thought I was a scally and a scumbag and I'm walking down the street in my trackies and people don't really want to lock eye contact even with me or they cross the road if they see me coming. Now I'm in Malaysia and I'm and I'm just like this English guy. People want to know me. People want to be me mate. They think Harry Potter, the Queen, cups of tea. Do you know what I mean? It was different, lad. And I was thinking like, wow, why is everyone being nice to me? Why are all these trying to be me mate? When I never really had that experience before when I was back home. It was more the opposite. <laughs> I can imagine. So you end up going into the gym. I know that throughout your life, you've been in a few street fights and you assumed that you'd have the ability to go in there and, and battle with all these fighters that were training in the gym. It didn't work out entirely like that. And I think everybody who's come off the streets and ended up in a gym can probably tell the same story. So what was it like developing your skills in a country like that? It wasn't even that I thought I'd beat up the fighters. It's that I'd walk in the gym. And I'm looking at everyone like, these are normal people. I'll beat these up. I didn't think I'd beat the fighters. I couldn't even beat the kids up. I was getting done in by everyone. I was getting done in by women. But that's because they knew jiu-jitsu and I never. But that's what made me want to learn it. Because I was like, what? I don't know what this shit is, but I want to know what they're doing to me so I can do it to other people. And I just applied myself every day. I just showed up every single day. And I feel like I just caught the bug instantly. Like, I just knew it was for me straight away. Um, I had a good coach who invested a lot of time in me. I had my first competition after only two months of training. I ended up winning that. I submitted everyone with the same submission. And then as soon as I'd competed, that was it. Like, you couldn't stop me. I just wanted to, when's the next one? When's the next one? When's the next one? And it just built from there. Like, I never had no aspirations or dreams of being a fighter. I never wanted to do MMA. I never wanted to compete in jiu-jitsu. It was just like one small step at a time. And I feel like the majority of that come down to good guidance and a good coach. My coach was like a, a real father figure. He was a real... He, he instilled a lot of discipline in me. Um, and I feel like we just built until it got to the point where I was fighting MMA. It's like it almost just kind of crept up on me. And before I know it, I'm a professional fighter. I'm traveling the world. I'm getting paid to compete. But then at the same time, it was all a bit weird because I'm on the run. <laughs> it's like I had to keep a secret from the world, you know what I mean? It's mentally, it's so different because you've got this complete juxtaposition in your life from this, from this negative to this immense positive. And you're building this record on Malaysian Invasion. You try out for the one championship Warrior Series. You're doing well then. And then the past fruits back up on you again for yeah. something you've not done. It's being taken away from you. Yeah, it was weird, lad, because I kind of felt a, sh a shift in everyone around me. Like, I'm this English guy. They think I'm a bit maybe from a good background. They think I'm a nice lad. Because at the end of the day, I'm a nice person and I respect people. I was never rude to anyone. I was never disrespectful to anyone. So they only knew me for, for how I treated them. But now, when I've got to the final of Malaysian Invasion and I'm fighting for the title, they've it's come to light that I'm I'm a wanted criminal and they've kicked me off the show. Um, me, me gym owner at the time went to the British Embassy, ended up getting me some letter to say I can fight in the final. I don't know how he got it, but he did. And then he ended up fighting in the final. But now it's common knowledge in amongst the gym that I'm a wanted criminal. And now I started to feel like some people viewed me different. Some people maybe distant, distant themselves from me. And then... I had my next table when I tried out for one one Warriors champion, uh, one championship, one Warriors se series. I ended up getting picked on the show out of hundreds of people. They picked me and Stamp Fairtex. She's gone on to be like Muay Thai world champion, MMA world champion, kickboxing world champion. Me and her got selected at, at the same time. And then I ended up getting kicked off that as well when I come back to Malaysia after the show. They also found out I was wanted once they Googled my name because it wasn't that hard. All she had to do was Google my name. And then it's like, it went from being a gym thing to like the whole 
I felt like the whole community in Malaysia knew. And then once I couldn't compete in one championship no more, the owner in my gym, he washed his hands with me. He was like, if you can't fight in one championship, I don't want you here. Because everyone else in my gym was all fighting on one championship. Like one of my teammates fought Ben Askren for the world title. Dude, like we were all coming up and doing well. And um, that's when I got kicked out of the gym, lad. And I just felt like throughout my whole career at that Asia scene, I felt like I'd do great things and then I'd meet a great hurdle and then I'd be back to square one again. And um, it was at that point then I got kicked out. I ended up deciding to make the choice to, to leave Malaysia because I didn't feel like there was no other gym that could facilitate me in the country. I ended up going to Thailand. I'd done a camp in Phuket top team. Um, I fought in Dubai against Hassan Mandor, a good wrestler. I ended up getting a knockout against him. And that's where I met my manager. I ended up signing to my manager, Sid Mogul Management. And then from there, I made the decision, like, maybe I should go back to Europe. I feel like I can get better opportunities. I've done everything I can really do in Asia. It's like everyone's put, closing the door on me. Um, that I, So I decided where where is most like Liverpool. That isn't Liverpool and I won't get nicked. So I decided to go to Ireland. And that's when I moved to Dublin. I ended up moving over to Dublin. Two days later, lockdown happens. I'm stuck in this country. I don't know anyone. I've got nowhere to train because all the gyms are shut. I got kicked out of my accommodation because of COVID. They wouldn't, they wouldn't, they give me all my money back. I had nowhere to stay. Like it was, it was half a rough time. But um, slowly but surely, things start to open up. Ended up training in SBG for a while. That was cool. Um, it really put things into perspective for me. I was like, where my level is. When you're training with guys who are like on Bellator, fought in the UFC, and you're j- just there with them, do you know what I mean? And then the same thing happened again. They found out I was wanted. I got kicked out of there. It just felt like it felt like I was really going around in circles. But I always say this: like everything that I've been through, I believe it happened for a reason. I believe. Maybe if I had an easier path, would I have trained as hard? Would I have been as motivated? Because even though these doors were getting shut in my face, rather than crying about it, I'd be more like, I want to show these cunts like what I'm made of. I want to prove everyone wrong. And um, getting kicked out of SPG ultimately took me to Dublin Combat Academy, where they met Colin Mahone and Craig Coakley. Um, I ended up training out of their gym. But rather than keeping it a secret, I just approached them straight away and told them, like, I can't be asked getting kicked out of another gym. I'll just be honest from the off-go. Told them about my situation, told them I didn't do it. I'm innocent. I did used to be a criminal, but I'm not now. And lad, they were just they were just like the boys. They was a proper cool vibe. Everyone in there was from a council estate. They understood. They could relate to me a little bit. And they just told me, as long as you're not involved in crime now, the kids are half look up to you. We were in the gym because all these are from council estates. And then um, I just got my head down and just kept training. Ended up fighting for the world title out of um, DCA in Belfast. A bit of a risk because it's the UK territory. But we, I just sneaked into the UK, fought, won my first world title as a professional. Um, went back to defend it. And then that's when I got arrested after that fight. Don't pass go, don't collect two hundred pounds straight to jail. <laughs> and that's where I ended up in Walton, lad. And I'd done six months on remand in Walton. Ended up getting a not guilty. Got released back home. First time in Liverpool in ten years. Went and joined up with Next Gen. And then things have just been building from there, lad. I've come out of come out of jail. I've won two world titles, now signed to Octagon. And I'm now making my Octagon debut, fighting on my first major promotion. And I couldn't be happy here, lad. And like I said, it was a tough path and it was a tough road. But I genuinely genuinely believe that everything happened the way it was meant to happen. Whether it was character building, whether it was toughness, whether it was to make me whether it was to test to see how bad I really want it, would I quit or not. I, I, I'm glad I went through the hurdles I went through because an easier path maybe wouldn't have took me this far. Your story is so incredible. Just to listen to you talk over the past two minutes there, how inspirational it is. No matter what obstacles that are put in your way, you just kept going and going and going. And what was that moment like 
when you came out of prison, you had that not guilty verdict, and your life is essentially now your oyster. You can do whatever you want with it. There's nothing holding you back. It was crazy, lad, because not seeing your family for 10 years, everyone's grown up, not seeing me little brother, not seeing me little brother grow from a, a child into a man, uh, not getting to train on this scene in my city, not getting to, like, I've always watched this scene as a major fan. Everyone from all different gyms, I've always wanted to train with different guys, and now I'm out and I can do everything I've ever wanted to do. It was like I just wanted to jump the gun and do it all in one day. Um I, I, I ended up waiting for the weekend to pass and then the first day on the, on, on Monday I was back in the gym I went straight to next gen yeah, I was gassing out like crazy I threw up in my first class <laughs> but I loved it lad it was just like I'm back I enjoyed it lad and I just fucking haven't stopped showing up since and I'm just hungry to fight I'm hungry to show my skills I'm, I'm, I'm finally now glad that I'm getting the I'm getting the platform that I deserve because I've watched everyone else around me get good platforms and progress while I just stayed stagnant. But I'm training as hard as they are. I'm just as good as they are, sometimes fucking 10 times better. But I'd always be like, I can't do what they're doing because I'm a once a criminal. And now it's so glad to be found innocent. People know the truth. And now I can get on with my life and better my family's life doing what I'm doing and better my own life, lad, because that's the dream. You could very easily right now go, I'm doing amazing, I'm in Octagon, I could spend all my time training and do as well as I could on mixed martial arts and just leave this chapter in the past. But rather than do that, you're using your story to help other people. You're giving back to the community. I know you're doing stuff with cells, so could you talk me through yeah. that? So, um... It's a, it's, a, it's a bit of a mad one. One of my mates um, from back in the day, similar background to me, went down the wrong path, was selling drugs, whatever, whatever. He went to jail. He got out. He actually linked up with Cells first. He's the one who introduced me to Cells. Um, he was going around schools doing talks on the repercussions of the bad choices you can make in your life. Um, the people who have to pay for the consequences, your mum, your dad, your family members, what it's like in jail, being in a gang ain't no fun. And he, he was the one who introduced me to Cells, and he was like, lad, you've got a powerful story. You can use that to help other kids. And I didn't really at first want to really do it. I wanted to help the kids, but I just didn't know if I'd be able to speak in front of them or would they want to listen to me. And it wasn't until like, I started getting involved and I started speaking to the kids and I've done the kids' podcast with them and I've gone to a few youth centres and spoke to the kids. And lad, I just look at them and I just see me when I was a kid. Some of the kids showing up in Bali, some of them shouting, shouting little mad remarks and that. And I just see me, lad, and I just think, you know what? I wish I had me when I was their age. Because when I was their age, there was no Paddy the Baddy. There was no Molly McCann. There was no Scousers doing this shit. There was no, like, all, all my role models were standing on the corner in big Bentleys and fucking selling crack. And I, like, I wanted what they had. Where now at their age, they can look at us and be like, nah, they want to be like them. They're on telly. They're fucking in the UFC or they're in Octagon or they're fighting for world titles. There's, there's other avenues, but if you don't if you don't ever see that representative of your people, you, sometimes you don't even know. You don't even know it's achievable. So I'm just glad now that I've got the opportunity to work with cells. I, I want to do more. Sometimes it's hard. Like I, I want to do more than I'm already doing. But at the same time, I understand, like, I've got to do as best as I can in my career and get my platform as big as possible so I can give back even more in the long run. Where if I was to focus all my energy now into giving back and I couldn't really pursue my career as much, my outreach wouldn't be as big. And I want to be able to, like, make it where the government get involved and we start getting funding and we can start teaching kids martial arts and we can have our own centre and... I, I want to do bigger, do bigger and better things. But right now, it's just a fucking, it's a bit of a dream. <laughs> but I'm giving back what I can. I'm open how I can. And um, anyone who's watching this, go and check out cells. They're a, they're a good, they're a good uh, bunch of people. And you can always use as much help as they can get from any member of the public, even if it's just 
dropping them a message and saying we appreciate what you're doing for the next generation because there's so many people out there who are doing the opposite lad. so it's good to see people who are doing good things yeah it's fantastic to see what you're doing and if just one kid that you've spoken to goes into the mixed martial arts gym and decides he doesn't want to go onto the streets and he wants to pursue something more noble and something that's going to help him better himself and better the people around him that'll be amazing in seeing obviously what you're doing coming up in just a couple of weeks at the next Oxygen show in Bratislava. If they're watching that, God knows that's going to inspire them. But looking yeah. at you personally now, how are you feeling going into this one? I know you've had a late change of opponent. You've had somebody pull out. But I imagine you've got this energy right now. You're making your debut. You're fighting in Eastern Europe, which is pretty crazy because you've had this mental story of leaving Liverpool to Malaysia to back to Ireland. So it seems like it's now the story of your life. That you're just all over the place. But how are you feeling going into this one? It's crazy, lad, because I feel like Octagon's just fitting through my career. I've always been like the travelling scouser who fights away. I've fought all over Asia. I've fought in the Middle East. I've fought in Ireland. I've still never fought in Liverpool, which is crazy. But it's just another part of the journey and another part of the story. And I'm blessed that I get to travel the world doing what I love. But the energy is high. I'm super confident. It can be anyone in front of me. It's just another body. We game plan in the gym for our opponents, but 90% of our work is based around me and what I'm good at. Implementing my game plan on anyone, it doesn't matter who it is, I've got to impose my will, no matter who the guy is in front of me. So it's it, it, it's a bit of a blessing in disguise that I just got to focus on me even more so in the camp. I'm feeling technically better than I've ever been in my life. Like when I used to fight at featherweight at this point in the camp, I'm in training and I'm dead. Like, I'm cutting so much weight that it's so hard to train. Where now I'm coming in the gym, I'm laughing, I'm smiling, I'm full of energy. I'm just so motivated and I just feel like me people are watching even more now than ever. I've got more support now than ever. And that just motivates me even more, lads, to put on a show. And I want to do whatever I can do to get the win and represent for Liverpool, lad. Absolutely. And you've proven throughout your career, even right at the start in Malaysia, it took you just two months of training to submit everybody in a tournament, which is pretty crazy when you look at the levels of the people who would have been in that. So I imagine it's not going to be long until you're knocking on the door of an Octagon title shot. There is a massive show coming up at the end of the year, Stage to the Cage. That's actually being headlined by your fellow Liverpool and Paul Smith. He's taking on Jake Quickenden. We're going to need a big card that night. How would you feel about maybe getting a title fight or a big matchup on that night? I am 100%. I don't care what anyone tells me. I'm fighting on that card and I'm going to make sure. I'm going to smash this fight. I'm going to try and sneak in another fight. And you can't deny me then. I'm going to be calling for the main event. I'm going to be calling for Keita. Come and defend the belt against me. Or vacate it and I'll fight some other guy for the belt. Like... I'm not here to pay me dues. I've done all that. I'm here to like stamp my name on the division. I mean, it's come in quick, vicious finishes, knockout submissions, and show everyone I'm not messing around. Like nine out of ten of these guys aren't on my level, and the ones who are on my level are just going to fall short. And that's just how it is. So when you look at Kata, obviously you're both world level fighters. You've both proven yeah. yourself in abundance. Why do you beat him? I honestly think uh, my style is the kryptonite for his style. I've watched fights where these four guys like Ronald Paradisi and he's had tough grappling matches and them guys don't grapple how I grapple. Okay, they might have a bit of wrestling, they might have a bit of jiu-jitsu. Nah, I'm a finisher. You can't let me take you back because I'll choke you out. That's guaranteed. If I get on top of you, you're not getting back up. I feel like he's very dangerous on the feet. He's very explosive. But he's a little bit small. I feel like I'll just manhandle him. I'll take him down. I'll impose my will on him and I'll finish him. I, I, I know will. I've seen that style so many times. I've dealt with that style so many times. And I know my style is horrible for that style. And I honestly feel he'll do his best to avoid me because so he should. But at some point, I'm going to be undeniable. And that's when it's going to be defend or vacate. Go down to Federweight and go and mess with the little boys then and I'll, I'll take the title and I'll just stay up here, lad. I don't mind. But you're going to have to come to a decision at some point 
fight Shamrock or give up the belt. That's a pretty damning statement. And I've got to ask you, because obviously he is from the same area as you. We've got these two lads contesting on this card, where you're hopefully going to be fighting for a belt. So you look at it now, you've got two lads, completely different stages of life. Jake, significantly younger than Paul. To my understanding, Paul's been doing it a little bit longer. So who do you expect to win this one? I've got no doubt in my mind that Paul gets the job done. I've trained with Paul and not only was I surprised by his skill set, I was surprised by his willingness to learn and his physical strength. I never expected him to be that strong. The thing that surprised me the most, he is so strong and I think he's got the experience over him. I think he's also, he's on the stage every night performing. People don't understand how much that translates to stepping in the cage all the pressure of the lights, thousands of people watching. And I think he's got a different motivation in the fact that he's doing it for charity. He's not doing this for money. Paul's not out here to get paid. Paul's doing this for charity. I feel like the other guy's doing it for a bit of a bit of a bit of cheddar, do you know what I mean? When you're fighting for money and things get a bit tough, you're still gonna get paid. You might look the easy way out. I know Paul ain't looking no easy way out. I feel like your man might come out, be a bit long, rangy. He might have the hands. But I feel like Paul just needs to get a hold of him. he get on top of him. And I think he'll just maul him, lad. I think it'll be quick as well. I think if he gets on top of him, it'll be a fast night. Well, Shem, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. I'm looking forward to watching your fight April 29th, live on DAZN. But before I let you go, is there anything that you would like to add that I perhaps haven't asked you about or anybody that you'd like to shout out? Shout out Next Generation, my team, all my training partners, Dublin Combat Academy, Team Buddha Jiu Jitsu, all of my sponsors. I love you all. Make sure you tune in April 29. You're going to see me get a first round finish.